But there we go. I'm used to that. So I thought we could start with some concepts, some terminology, vocabulary, notation, that kind of stuff. That way you can get used to the way that I talk about things and hopefully try to map that onto the way that you're used to hearing about them or reading about them. So if I can give you a brief background as to where my approach came from. I started trying to teach myself multi-level modeling and longitudinal analysis as a graduate student when I was at the University of Kansas. And the way that that worked is that my supervisor, I was a graduate research assistant working in the Lifespan uh, Institute where I was part of a unit that did data analysis and data management, that kind of stuff. She handed me a book and it was Snyder's and Bosker's multi-level analysis book, their first edition. And she said, I need you to learn how to do growth, growth curve modeling. Read this. Okay. So I read it at about the rate of one page a day, give or take. And I was going through this book and it's all about clustered data. It's all about students nested in schools as their example of what is multi-level. And so I'm reading this and thinking, what does this have to do with longitudinal data? Like this is all about kids. I have no idea. And then finally I get to one chapter and they're like, oh, by the way, occasions are nested in people too, it's fine. So I knew just enough to be dangerous when I left graduate school. Do you know that expression? It means that I can make the numbers come out. I have no idea what to do with them. I have no idea if they're right, but they, I got numbers, so okay. And I was a postdoc then at uh, Penn State University working with Scott Hofer in the human development section. And there I got a chance to audit some more courses, most notably with my Brovine. And I was the person who had their hand up in the air every 30 seconds asking a question because I was finally feeling like I was starting to put stuff together. And then everybody in their methodology department managed to go on sabbatical at the same time. And they had no classes to offer. And so they asked if I wanted to teach something. So I picked multi-level models because I learned it 10 minutes ago. This will be fine. I can do this. And I could not do this. I, I realized quite quickly how little I knew when I tried to explain it to someone else. So I spent that uh, probably a whole year just doing a really deep dive and reading as much as I could and really trying to understand it. And then I felt like I was slightly less dangerous. But what that experience taught me from trying to teach myself most of this is that that's really hard to do. So what I want to give each of you is the introduction I wish I would have had. Because I'm one of those people who does not deal well with abstract concepts. When the chapter starts, let x equals, you know, theta r sub j, and it's like, nope, 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 I need words, I need ideas, I need nouns. So I'm starting from a more conceptual perspective, working my way down into the, the nitty gritty. Um, after you finish this workshop, I cannot promise you that you will be able to do everything you wanna do. But what I hope is that you'll be able to read more on your own and have a background in your head for what they're trying to tell you about and that will make it a lot easier to attach those details and procedures to that framework. So that hopefully the, um, the, vid the recordings will help um, I also teach, I'm going to be teaching again, a class on longitudinal modeling from a multi-level perspective this fall. And I'm going to be teaching an advanced second se semester of it in the spring. So I'd keep everything on YouTube. You're welcome to make use of those materials as well. So this will be hopefully something useful, a start, but not necessarily the end. Is that, is that fair? I wanna put that out there because there are some people who think I'm gonna to go to this workshop and then I'm gonna know how to do this. It's like, mm, no, it's, it's an unrealistic expectation. But Thorsten wanted me to make sure that we build in a little bit of time to practice. So that will be later this afternoon and then later tomorrow. I have some uh, examples that I'll go through where we actually go through R code and M plus code and the output so that you'll know what the numbers mean. And then I'll give you um, a couple of activities where you can try to make the numbers come out yourselves. Okay, what do we think about that? Again, voting system ups, sideways or down. Okay, excellent. And you can talk too, if that's fine. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm used to, so what happened to Iowa is that we were all back in person last year. And that was a big push to get everybody back on campus. 
except that I didn't feel comfortable forcing people to come to campus if they were worried about getting sick or if they did get sick. And a lot of my students are older students who have children who may not be vaccinated. And so I said, okay, we're gonna do a hybrid option. You can choose to come on Zoom or you can choose to be in person. And I got about three people each day in person and the rest were on Zoom. So I had to develop a system by which the people on my monitor and the people in front of me could talk to each other and we settled on thumbs. Um, interestingly, Zoom does not have thumbs sideways or thumbs down emojis, but it has several that will work in its place. So, but since we're all in person and I'm not on Zoom, you can communicate however you'd like. Alrighty, away we go then. So first up, some vocabulary. You will hear these phrases come out of my mouth repeatedly. So I think a good place to start is to define them. So when one collects longitudinal data, there's different types of relationships between variables that you can find. The first type is what you would find if you just had a cross-sectional sample to start with, which is between person relations. If I'm higher on X, do I tend to be higher on Y? And the key idea there is higher than other people. So the relative comparison is mean differences between people or differences in level between people. And this is the type of variability that you would have for any longitudinal study that starts as a cross-sectional sample. If you wanna sound fancy, you can say inter-individual differences rather than between person. And any measures that we collect once per person, we refer to as time invariant or time constant. You can say those words. The additional part and the whole reason that you would go to the trouble to collect longitudinal data is to be able to examine within person relationships or intra-individual differences. And the measures that are collected multiple times per person are known as time varying. And this is the part that's extra. What's complicated about longitudinal data is that both of these things are happening at the same time as well as potential interactions. So any variable that you measure over time, you're interested in whether that variable maybe fluctuates across time or changes systematically across time, but people have a consistency to them. So if I ask you in a, in a daily diary or an ecological momentary assessment type of study, how stressed do you feel today? Some people every day are going to report that they have more stress on average, and some days are worse than others. Both of those things can be true at the same time, and it could be that the effect of having more stress than you're used to differs across people. And it could be the, the effect of having more stress that you're used to depends on how much you have on a regular basis. All of those things can be true. So just because you have longitudinal data doesn't mean that you're gonna end up looking at just within person relationships. It's going to be all of it at the same time. And the trickiest part of these models is finding a way to keep them separate, to keep the interpretation. Am I talking about more than other people or am I talking about more than usual or more than I started with? The change versus fluctuation. And I say between person as the end of my phrases here because that's what I'm used to thinking of. But the same concepts hold for any type of sampling unit that is measured repeatedly. So in the College of Education where I teach at the University of Iowa, we might have people who are studying schools as their unit of analysis and collecting school level information for every academic year. In that case, it would be between and within school. Uh, for those of you who are used to clustered samples instead of persons nested in groups, then that would be between and within group. So the adjectives between and within always hold. What they're attached to depends on what's being sampled repeatedly. Another set of vocabulary that I think is important because it guides the most useful type of modeling strategy is whether your longitudinal data can be characterized as reflecting within person change or within person fluctuation. And there's a continuum on here because rarely is it's only one or the other. There's usually some kind of hybrid that's happening. So within person change is what one thinks of in a classic longitudinal setting where the point of the study is to see what happens over time 
when time is sampled meaningfully with enough distance between where you think something should have changed. So your classic randomized control trial where you randomize people to a control versus treatment at baseline and then you see what happens. And the goal is to make the treatment group change differently than the control group. That's that type of study. This, this type of picture goes with that type of idea. And this type of analysis that would be most useful to answering that question is often called growth curve models. And you can stick the word latent in front of it if you use software for structural equation models instead of multi-level models, but it's a semantic distinction because random effects and latent variables are the same thing. That's coming later on. Interestingly, it is always called a growth curve, even if the outcome that you're measuring declines, and even if it declines linearly. So I can have you know, people heading down, and it's still a growth curve model. That's just the terminology that people use. One of the key ideas here is that if people change differently, then an outcome's variance and covariance over time has to change with it. So as shown by this uh, simplistic drawing here, if people spread themselves out, there's going to be more variability at later points in the study than earlier points, or the opposite could happen. They could start out the same, and then um, they could start out different, and then had to be the same. So variance and covariance must change over time if people change differently. The other side of the picture is what I refer to as fluctuation. And here, time is usually irrelevant. Time is just a way to get a lot of data per person. So it's not so much that it's time one or time two, it's how stressed are you today? How grumpy are you today? How sick are you today? How much social support do you feel today? Those kinds of processes, you're not trying to fix anybody. You're just watching what happens. And so then you wouldn't expect that, you know, social support would increase systematically over the course of two weeks. You might expect something like this. So time is on the x-axis here to make the point that there may not be any systematic effects of time in this type of data. But we're still going to see between person differences and how people fluctuate around their own usual levels, as well as potentially between person differences in the amount of fluctuation. So this pink line here, this person varies a lot more around their mean than any of the other people. That's a between person difference that you can quantify and predict. And then you get things sort of in between. So a lot of the fluctuation studies that I've seen are measuring outcomes like cortisol. Does anyone have cortisol data in here? No? Okay. Well, very briefly, I know this much about cortisol. But what I know is that it peaks about 30 minutes after you wake up and then it declines the rest of the day. And if it doesn't decline, that's bad. That's a, that's a symptom of, of bad things. So in that case, you would need a growth curve to model the within-day change in cortisol, but you might expect that that pattern differs across days of the week or people as well. So again, kind of a mixture of the two. So as you look at this sort of thing, those of you who have longitudinal data, which camp do you think you're going to be in? Fluctuation? Hands? Couple? I, know, I heard the word diary, so that, that usually points to this. So diary folks, what kinds of variables are you measuring over time? Stressors. Stressors, yeah, that's a big one. Good. Well, perhaps not, though. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, so, so you know that expression, stay tuned? Like when you're watching a show and they want you to come back after the commercial, I say that a lot. So that is my version of foreshadowing, things that we will talk about later. Stay tuned. Anyone over here? Treatment studies? Yes? Yeah, so we have a control group and a experimental group and we hope to see something new after a half a year or a year. And what is changing? Uh, also the D. It's a very large study, so we have a lot of outcome variables. Uh, so also, I think uh, physical health and things like that. Okay. Very good. 
this is good. This helps me get a sense of, of where to go with, with the stories and the examples. So why would we do longitudinal research? I want to give you just a flavor of the types of research questions that one might, might think of. Uh, the big one, to explore within person change. So there's different layers of complexity to answering this type of question. So on average, which we will learn is governed by the fixed effects of the model, if does my treatment result in faster growth or more growth relative to some standard process? We also might be interested in between person differences in how people change over time. So that will be modeled by what are known as random effects. A random effect is any effect slope that each person gets their own of. And in this case, why is it that some people change faster or more than others? I don't know, but we can find out by looking at person characteristics as predictors of that variation. And a big one for me, at least when I was getting started in this, I used to do work in the area of cognitive aging, and it was a big controversy as to how one should study aging in terms of research design. Because what had happened for many, many years is that people would take samples of adults varying from, say, 20 to 80, and they would look at cross-sectional age differences and try to make conclusions about how people aged, even though no one aged during the study. And if you think about selection processes of these samples, the people who are still around at age 80 are not a random subsample of all the people who could have been there, right? They're not only still alive, but they have the capacity to be able to participate in research. So you're talking about aging from one type of person into a completely different set of people. That's somewhat problematic. On the other hand, longitudinal studies of cognitive aging, in order to measure change in cognition, you're supposed to give the same measure or at least similar measures repeatedly over time. But you know what happens when you do something over and over again? You get better at it. So at the same time that people are increasing because of practice, they're decreasing because of age. And so then folks were like, no, 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 longitudinal research is bad because it's contaminated with these practice effects. And so long as you have time intervals in which people are both practiced and older, every time you get them, there's no way to pull those two apart. So this is sort of a big issue, is how much of what we think of as aging is actually due to the effect of being older, meaning being part of a different cohort, as opposed to getting older. So being older maps onto between person age differences, getting older maps onto within person age change. And growth curve models, as I said, are sort of the standard protocol to answering these types of questions. A different focus would be the daily diary such of things. Within person fluctuation or dynamics, that's a word that gets thrown, out, thrown around a lot in that context. You, you will hear my opinion of dynamics throughout the week, or the week. It'll feel like a week, but it's only two days. <laughs> I'm here all week, let's put it that way. So for these sorts of questions then, the same demarcation applies, just within a different context. So on average, meaning carried by the fixed effects, if I sleep less than usual, am I more impatient the next day? Probably. Or is it, if I'm impatient all day and I'm snapping at everyone, do I sleep less well the next night because I'm replaying all the mean things I said in my head? Right? Both of these things can be true at the same time. But the key idea is less than usual. So I know some people are used to six hours of sleep and some people are used to nine hours of sleep, but if you take two hours away from either of us, bad things happen. It's all about relative to usual. Between person differences can occur in those effects too. So why are some people more affected by sleep deficits than others? I don't know. We can find out though by examining person predictors as potential mechanisms why some people have stronger within person associations between, say, sleep and grumpiness. And this type of back and forth, you'll see me make this gesture, this X thing. This is my abbreviation for cross-lag panel, the idea of 
this x predicts the next y, and this y predicts the next x, and we're not sure which is the stronger path, and that's the whole point. So these sorts of questions are often answered with either multi-level models, which is a term that is used when you're predicting one outcome at a time. So I tend to call that univariate multi-level. Uh, multi-level structural equation models, which is really just a multivariate version of multi-level unless you have a measurement model, as well as single-level structural equation models, cross-lag panel, as it's sometimes called, or autoregressive cross-lag panel. And we will go through all of these tomorrow and how they map onto each other, what they can tell you, and what they can't. <laughs> and then the last one is something that is less well known, but to me is an opportunity in terms of new research questions. The idea of predicting within-person instability. So the term that goes with this in terms of modeling is what's known as location scale mixed effects models. And the idea is that some people, if I were to measure their mood over time, are like this, right? Nothing bothers them. And then some people are like this. That idea of why are some people this and some people are like this, that's the type of prediction we're talking about. So you can examine within-person inconsistency as between-person differences in residual variance. So things like medication adherence. Maybe the goal of your treatment isn't to make people higher on some outcome. Maybe it's to make them more stable. A lot of medical outcomes are like that. Uh, glucose, uh, minutes of vigorous activity, medication adherence. There's all kinds of things where we want you to be more stable, not just better at it. And so you can examine the extent to which treatment can improve within person fluctuation. So the idea of variance goes along with inconsistency or instability. Lack of variance would be the opposite. Um, in cognitive aging, one of the findings that was uh, coming out around the time that I was paying attention is looking at variability in doing a task. So if you give a task to an older adult, they might do worse over time, but what was more interesting was the variability in within task performance. And it turned out that inconsistency was a predictor of subsequent decline. Before things go off, they start to get a little bit more wobbly. So those are just some of the ideas that I had. Any others that I should add to my list? I uh, have had a chance to help a great number of investigators with grant applications. And a lot of times when they first come to me with their specific aims or their research questions, they would say things like, I want to know how stress and grumpiness relate over time. That's not specific enough. And so this type of menu, I start asking these questions like, do you mean this or do you mean that? Or do you want both? because how do these things relate over time is not a question that can be answered. So is it that people who are more stressed are grumpier? That's between. Is it when I'm more stressed than usual, I'm grumpier than usual? That's within. Is it the extent to which stress and grumpiness relate to each other differs between people? That's both. That's the idea of a random slope. So as, as we progress, I hope that you can become a little bit more specific in how you're thinking about your data and what your data can tell you. And this is just some of the list, but these are the things that I tend to see. At least the first two are most common, and the third one I'm trying to make happen. Do you know the movie Mean Girls? No? There, there's a line in the movie where someone is trying to start the word fetch as an expression, and one of the mean girls yells at her and says, Gretchen, stop trying to make fetch happen. So I'm trying to make fetch happen with within person instability here. All right, so sources of time. Again, relations over time. Well, what do you mean by time? That's actually more complicated than one might think. So if I'm measuring long-term change, say, in elementary students, so I may start out with people who are in, we call it in the states, first grade, second grade, third grade. My son just finished first grade. He's seven years old. 
So if I had first, second, and third graders, and then I followed them each for three years, and I want to talk about change over time, well, what should time be? If I'm interested in an academic outcome, then time should probably be great because they're all learning the same things at roughly the same rate. If I'm interested in a biological outcome, like in older kids, maybe the, the advent of puberty, then that has to do with how old they are, not necessarily what grade they're in, because people can be held back, they can skip grades, and so you can have two to three years of age variation within the same grade. In the case of older adults who might be suffering from, say, dementia or some other systematic process, how old they are may not be as important as when they were diagnosed and how far into that trajectory they are. Uh, something like uh, ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease is what we call it, um, that's a disease where it's, there's a very sharp sort of drop off in capacity and everyone sort of follows the same trajectory, sadly enough. And that can happen to you when you're 40 or when you're 80. So then it's time to event where diagnosis might be an event or something like a stroke. If you're looking at recovery from a stroke, stroke is time zero, and then you can measure change from that point. So it's not always obvious what time should be, even when you're sampling people over time on purpose. Uh, for within person, person fluctuation, even though there's no systematic change that's expected, there still may be time-related patterns. So if I'm measuring something like fatigue, and I'm doing it with one of those studies where like your phone beeps you and you answer a bunch of questions at random intervals, I'm probably going to have a different trajectory of fatigue if you ask me at 8 a.m. versus at lunchtime versus at night. So there may be sort of a, I'm tired in the morning, I feel better during the day, and then I get more tired at night. So there's still time that's relevant in that case. Same is true for cortisol. Day of the week. Do you think people are more stressed out when during the workday than on the weekend? Probably. It probably matters whether it's Monday through Friday or Saturday or Sunday. So even though you're not potentially interested in that difference, it still would need to be controlled for in your model so that you could examine the things you are interested in. Um, day in study is another one if there's reactivity to the measurement process. So people may answer the questions differently after they've answered them 20 times than the first time they see them. And if I, uh, I can, can I tell you a quick story? I tell a lot of stories. So there was a study that I was privy to at Penn State, and this was before smartphones. So it was a study where they called you every night to get your answers to these questions. Mm -hmm. On your landline, right? I don't even, I haven't had a landline line since 2003, so that's how old this is. But anyway, they would call you up and they had a filter question Did anything stressful happen today? And if you said yes, there were like 10 follow up questions. Well, people started figuring out that if they said, Nope, I'm good, thanks, they got off the phone faster and they still got their payment. So if you plot stress throughout the study, there's this remarkable decline in stress that happens as the study goes on, completely artifactual, but still needs to be controlled for before you can look at how stress relates to other things. So this is my, my public service announcement to all of you who are collecting diary type data. Time is still in there. It just may not be in the typical way of time one, time two, time three. So you want to do a little bit of exploration to see what time trends might be relevant based on what types of variables you're collecting. Does time vary both within and between persons? If so, then we have to address each of those components separately. So this is found in what is known as accelerated longitudinal designs or cohort sequential designs. So the example I gave of first graders, second graders, and third graders measured over time if I just put one trajectory through all of that, then I am ignoring which cohort they came from. And if this year's first graders are different than last year's first graders, then I'm in trouble. So what I would do in that case is have one variable for how, what grade were you in when you started?
that's between person grade differences that are cross-sectional, and then what happened to you as we followed you over time as within person change. So I would literally split it into the two pieces of information that we have with respect to the timing. That becomes even more important the more spread you have in time at the beginning and the more potential there are for cohort or selection effects to make it so the people who are older when they start are different than the people who are younger. And then last but not least, terminology that I will use that dictates what your modeling choices are to a great extent is whether you can think of your time as balanced or unbalanced. Balanced means that everybody has the same possible set of occasions. So if I'm doing a treatment study and I measure everybody at baseline and then I have a follow-up occasion and then I have a, like a follow-follow-up occasion, that's balanced. Even if the distances between the occasions are not the same, it's still balanced. And even if not everybody has all of the occasions, it's balanced because the possibilities are the same. In contrast, the types of studies where they beep you on your phone randomly, that's like the definition of unbalanced. And you could round it into, well, these are occasions where like at eight-ish, and this is nine-ish, and 10-ish, but you wouldn't wanna do that. So if the data are unbalanced, there are fewer choices as to how you can measure, model, the effect of person dependency, as we'll call it, the idea that occasions from the same person are more related than occasions from different people. Doesn't mean you can't model it, there's just different sets of choices. And so in this case, it's really more of an incomplete data problem because not everybody has the same possible set of, of occasions. And this can also be a consequence of using a time metric that varies between persons. So for instance, if I were doing a study using archival data. Let's say I have a hospital database. I'm looking at what happens to people after surgery. I have whatever measures they collected for whatever reasons. I don't have, okay, this is one hour after surgery and this is two hours after surgery. I just, I have whenever the nurses got there and they made the measurements. So that type of data set would also be unbalanced, even though it's a data set where we might be looking at change instead of fluctuation. Okay. 10.45, how are we doing? Thumbs? Two thumbs. <laughs> okay, I, I take it back, just one thumb. Uh, questions or comments so far? No, not yet. I don't mind awkward pauses. I can handle it. Okay. Don't hesitate to, uh, to stop me if something comes to you too. All right, let's talk models. So my framework for teaching these is to talk about what happens on each side of a model. And all models have each side. There's two sides. One is the model for the means and the other is what I call the model for the variance. Now, when you're first starting to learn about statistical models, like general linear models, regression models is sort of the starting point, I guarantee that this is what you think of in your head when you think of the model. It's what outcomes do I have? What predictors do I have? How, come back. <laughs> it's decided I'm done. There we go. I think it goes to sleep after an activity or something. So we'll just wake it back up. That's fine. So how do the predictors relate to the outcomes? Do they only have main effects? If it's a quantitative predictor, is it a linear slope or do I need something kind of nonlinear, bendy? Uh, do I have interaction effects such that the effect of one predictor depends on the level of another? These are all questions that are answered in the model for the means, which means the fixed effects. And so what you learned initially in regression as intercepts and slopes these are fixed effects. And when I teach these models, that's what I call them. Because the key idea is that those intercepts and slopes are constants. Like if your slope is two, that means that for this predictor, the change in Y is two for every one unit change in X. And that two holds for everybody equally. 
fixed means everybody gets the same. The model for the variance then is the random effects and the residuals. So when we first start looking at a regression model, there's a little letter at the end of it, right? What letter is that? To me, it's E, might be R, could be like epsilon if you want to go Greek notation, right? But there's, an, there's a letter. And you're initially taught, well, okay, so if you want to use this model, then that E has to be independent across observations, it has to be normally distributed, and it has to have constant variance. Those are actually choices. Assumptions are not assumptions, they are choices. That's like saying, I want a pizza that only has cheese on it. Like, well, that's what I ordered, that's what I'm going to get. I assume that pizza is vegetarian, because that's what I ordered. Now, if my pizza is not vegetarian, if they screw up and they put you know, meat on it, I can pick the meat off, but it's kind of still there, and it's not ideal. That would be like using a data transformation to try to change your model. It's not ideal. It turns out that if any one of those assumptions is not true, you order a different pizza. You pick a new model. So these are the ways that we, it's very different than what you're used to thinking about, but it's the same idea of building a model. So we're introducing the idea of random effects in addition to residuals, and we have to make sure that we have addressed all of the ways in which those residuals are related from the same person, as well as all the ways in which their variance changes as a function of predictor variables. So the model for the variance is the big difference that separates what people start learning in terms of general or generalized linear models from what follows. All right, so modeling person dependency then, that's what the model for the variance is going to be for in most cases. So the idea of dependency, that is a term that statisticians use and it makes it sound like it's a problem. The alternative perspective is that dependency is the point. You're trying to see what is in common to a person, how they change or how they fluctuate over time, so that you can pull apart what is between from within. Dependency just means correlation. It's the idea that if you sample one sampling unit like a person more than once, the outcomes that come from them are going to be more related than outcomes that come from different people. That's always going to be the case in longitudinal data. It's usually the case in cluster data too, although to a much less extent. If we ignore this problem, if you use a regular old regression model on longitudinal data, that will be very wrong for numerous reasons. One of them, which people understand quite well, is the idea that the standard errors and the p-values are going to be incorrect because your standard error comes from your model for the variance. If you have the wrong standard error for a slope, the p-value that shows up with it is not going to be correct either. But what's more insidious to me is the idea that the relationship you're capturing cannot possibly be correct if you're using one relationship to capture different levels of relations. So if I have some people are more stressed than others, and people who have more stress might have worse well-being, that's one thing. When I'm more stressed than usual, I may feel worse than usual. That's a separate thing. And if, but if I just build a regression model that has stress predicting well-being, and I got one slope, that one slope has to do the job of two separate relationships. And only when they're exactly the same could it be right. They're not going to be exactly the same, though, because they're on different scales. Because the between-person variability contributes to the between-person slope, the within-person variability contributes to the within-person slope, and those are going to be different numbers. So as we will see, standardized effects are not really a thing in multi-level models because it's very difficult in some cases to pull apart which standard deviation is relevant at what level or combined. So if you have one slope that's trying to do the job of two, that's not possibly going to work. And there's probably more than two that can be present in any given data analysis. So how do we address this? There's basically three choices, and I'll walk through each of these. One is fixed effects. So we control for person as a, 
uh, yeah, control variable. We'll stick with that. Another is to just let the dependency be there and model the residual correlation directly. And the third is to add a level, which involves adding in random effects. So the first choice then, fixed effects. In the College of Education, there are a lot of single case designs that folks use to study behavior, where they'll collect you know, hundreds of observations on one child, and they'll do experimental manipulations during different phases. And they might do that for four or five children. If they wanted to pool all of that data, given that they only have four or five people, this is what I would tell them to do. You would literally use person ID as a categorical predictor in the model. So that would be a factor variable, as you might hear it in R. And so you would need N minus one dummy codes, essentially, to fully saturate all person mean differences. If you also had person differences in the effect of time or any other predictor that's being measured repeatedly, you would then need N minus one interaction terms for those person dummy codes so that you can fully saturate all the reasons why some people change differently. And this is both good and bad. It does control for person dependency. You have filled up your model with all the ways that people differ from each other by putting in their ID variable as a predictor. And this is actually more common than random effects in certain social sciences. And there are debates about whether you should have fixed effects versus random effects in those, uh, in those fields. And there's a direct analog to what we'll talk about tomorrow with respect to that. Um, it's also useful if what you really want to know is what happened to each sampling unit. So if I have a study where I've sampled, say, countries repeatedly, and I want to be able to talk about how Germany differs from the U.S., right, then I need those country IDs to be a fixed effect so I can talk about this is what happens for Germany and this is what happens for the U.S., and I can do significance tests to make comparisons or whatever. So if you're interested in making inferences about the specific units being sampled, this gets you there. Why it's less useful in most cases, though, is that you can't then predict why. So if I have a hypothesis that countries that have this characteristic will have different outcomes than countries that have that characteristic, and I control for which country is which, I can't do it. It's redundant. So random effects, instead of fixed effects, allow us to not only quantify how much differences there are between people or units measured repeatedly, but then potentially predict why those differences are there. So fixed effects does not allow that. Okay, questions so far? So we're not going to do this. Next. Can we just let the residuals be correlated? Yeah. And if I only have two or three occasions and those occasions are balanced, absolutely this is what I would do. So if I had something like pre-test, post-test, I don't need to do any kind of random effects modeling. I can just have two separate outcomes, predict them simultaneously, so it's a multivariate model. I can let each of those outcomes have a different variance, and I can directly model their covariance. Done, done. In a structural equation modeling, that would be like having two boxes and just putting a covariance between the two. Done. Easy peasy. Is that a phrase you know? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy? <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but my son says it a lot. So. so if it's so easy peasy, why do I not just do that for everything? Well, it turns out you can't. Uh, it's only possible for balanced data. So if I have pre-test and post-test is my two boxes, that's cool. But if I have, I buzzed you then, and I buzzed you then, and I buzzed you then, that doesn't fit neatly into a box. So it doesn't work for unbalanced data. More generally, this doesn't work for any data set where all of the observations cannot be summarized by one covariance matrix. So I could have, like, I measured at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, but if you were measured at 8.04 and you were measured at 9.10 and someone else was measured at 11.15, I need different rows for each of those possibilities, and then the whole thing gets to be too sparse and too big. So this doesn't work for unbalanced data. 
It also doesn't work when using generalized linear models, things like logistic regression, count regression, where I don't have a residual variance. If I don't have a residual variance, I can't let the residuals be correlated. There's no way to directly let that happen using maximum likelihood at least. This is the approach that I, I at least was initially taught because what this falls under is the heading of repeated measures ANOVA. And what I learned as repeated measures is actually two different things. I only learned the first one in grad school. Um, the univariate approach, which is the idea where we're gonna hold each person as their own control, that is going to be equivalent to what we'll see is a random intercept only model where we're controlling for person mean differences and that's it. And in that case, we're assuming that across all of the repeated measures, the residual variance is the same, and all the residual covariances are the same. That can only happen if people change the same. If people change differently, game over. The other option is the MANOVA version, where you think of it as each outcome gets a separate variance and they all get separate covariances. That's the easy peasy lemon squeezy. That starts to fall apart if you have lots and lots of outcomes. So if I have two or three, fine. If I have 10, that's going to be like 55 covariances and variances that I have to model before I even get to the things I care about. By the way, this is a matrix. That's what this gesture is. So it's the lower diagonal of the matrix. I guess I should go that way for you guys. I have a really hard time flipping my gestures. So like, this versus this. It will be backwards to you and I apologize, but it's correct in, in the way that I'm looking at it myself. I am spatially challenged. Uh, so people often bag on ANOVA. They say that, you know, you shouldn't use ANOVA anymore. There's absolutely nothing wrong with these two models if they fit. The problem is that when people use these words, they're almost always talking about least squares estimation. And ordinary least squares requires complete data. In order to compute you know, the sum of squares between and the sum of squares within, you've got to have all the numbers that go into the sum or it doesn't work. And if you don't have all the data, you kick the whole person out. And that's really dissatisfying. It lowers your power, it threatens your inferences, and we don't want to do that if we don't have to. So these sorts of models are usually very important baselines in, as in describing longitudinal data, sort of the, the simplest case and the most complex case but we're going to use likelihood estimation instead so that we can use all of the occasions that we have for an individual and not throw away whole people if we don't have to. So likelihood estimation not only saves us in terms of list-wise deletion, but it also offers more choices. And the, the program that I'm most familiar with is uh, SAS Proc Mix, which I understand no one uses here, and that's why I don't have it in any of my examples. But they have, I think, approximately 37 choices as to what sort of pattern your variances and covariances can have. So this is where we get into like the, the compound symmetry and compound symmetry heterogeneous and first order autoregressive and topolits and there's spatial ones instead of just time ones and all that kind of stuff. That's in this sort of direct, just model the correlation version that we're talking about here. And then the big one, number three, this is what we're going to do. We're going to add a level. So a level to me corresponds to a dimension of sampling. So if I have occasions and I have persons, I have two levels at a minimum because there are occasion to occasion differences and there are person to person differences. And so that's at least two levels, one type of variability corresponding to remaining differences at each level. But there can be more than one. So person-to-person -person differences in what? In the mean, in change over time, in the effect of stress, or all of the above. So a person is a level, but each level can have more than one type of random effect. And what a random effect is, quite simply, is that something that each person gets their own of. Rather than it being a constant, it's a variable. And we will see lots of examples of those. So random effects are very useful, not just conceptually, but also statistically. So it allows us to quantify how much of the total variability is because some people start out higher, 
How much is because some people change faster? How much is because some people respond to stress differently, for instance? But behind the scenes, adding in random slopes is also simultaneously introducing heterogeneity of variance. So what we will see later on is that when you specify, say, a random linear time slope, that is saying there's a very particular pattern that says how the variance is supposed to change over time and how each pair of covariances is supposed to change too as a function. And so that solves the constant variance problem, so to speak, in terms of a regular regression. And it also solves the independence problem because it builds in correlation. It works for general or generalized models. So no matter what kind of outcome you have, you can add random effects to it, albeit sometimes more difficulty in estimation. And it works for balanced or unbalanced data. So this can get tricky as to what's a level and what's not a level. If, technically speaking, persons and occasions are crossed if everybody is measured on the same schedule, but once you put in which occasion is which, or some kind of function for change over time, then time is not a level and it simplifies to just occasions within persons. If I have something like a randomized control trial, and let's say that people are nested in groups, so I have a control group and I have a treatment group. Group is not a third level in that case, because once I put in which of the two groups each person is in as a dummy-coded fixed effect, then there's no more group dependency. When group would need to be a level is if you had, say, 10 control groups, 10 treatment groups. So if you were doing your study over multiple sites, for instance, to be able to get enough people, then if you put in a fixed effect for whether you're in control or treatment, that's not enough. Because people from the same control group are probably going to be more alike than people from different control groups. And so then you would need a third level of people nested in groups, occasions, people, groups, to, because there's variability that remains after putting in the fixed effects. For those of you who are doing daily diary stuff, are you sampling once a day or more than once a day? More than once? You got yourself three levels, potentially. So do you think that observations taken from the same day are going to be more related than observations taken from different days? Probably it's an empirical question. That's also a phrase you'll hear me say a lot. That means you can do a test on the data and it will tell you. Probably yes, though, in most types of outcomes. So then you would have level one is observations within a day. If you have multiple days worth of data, then that's level two. And then multiple people, that's level three. As a general rule, if you can't figure out what levels are nested within which other levels, you don't have nesting, you have crossing instead. So there are some types of group designs that get to be complicated, like if people change groups over time. So if I measure students in a classroom at time one, and then time two is a different classroom, then students are not nested in classrooms, they're crossed. So it would be level one is occasion, nested in level two student, Occasion is also nested within level two classroom, and I've got two different level twos at the same time that are crossed with each other. That is also the type of design. Uh, who was it that was doing experimental stuff? Is that you, sir? So like if you have people who respond to the same items or stimuli, that's another instance in which a response is nested in a person. It's nested in an item, and items and persons are crossed such that a trial is the unique combination of both. And if people see each item under more than one condition, then it gets even uglier, potentially. So, but in a good way, in a complicated way, in a good way. All right. So these are the words that you might search the Google for if you're interested in learning about more uh, from a statistical point of view, what, how these models would be differentiated from each other in terms of their contents. So what we start with, at least in my world, is general linear models, the idea of ANOVA and regression. They are designed for data that has one dimension of sampling, and the outcome is plausibly normally distributed. 
If you have any other kind of outcome, you switch to generalized, where ized means the changes to the model for anything that's not normal. That usually involves a link function, like a logit or a probit or a log, as well as some other conditional distribution besides normal. So like count regression, logistic regression, those kinds of things, but they're still for one dimension of sampling. When we pick up the adjective mixed, then that is the introduction of random effects in addition to fixed effects. So mixed means the combination of the two. Fixed is everybody gets their own, uh, the same, and random is everybody gets their own. And all of these are considered linear because they are of the form constant times variable plus constant times variable as opposed to some other complex nonlinear function involving exponents or logs or stuff like that. All right. One, yeah, one more slide and then we'll take a break. How's that sound? Enthusiastic thumbs on that point, absolutely. One of the challenges, at least for me initially, and in trying to learn this was trying to figure out how things are related. And I gotta tell you, there are way too many words to talk about the same things. So I have this as multi-level model or MLM word salad. Multi-level model is the term that I prefer. I think it's the most descriptive in general. But if you are from other places, you might call what I'm going to be talking about linear mixed effects models. Again, mixed means fixed plus random. Random coefficient models. Or the term hierarchical linear model, or HLM, which is what it's called in education. It's not the same thing as hierarchical or stepwise regression, though. All of these things, then, are special cases. So random effects ANOVA or repeated measures ANOVA where you've introduced one random effect, it's an intercept in those cases. That's a special case of this, albeit with a different method of estimation. Growth curve models, again, where the term latent implies the use of SEM software. And this will be something we do tomorrow, trying to get to the intersection of where multi-level meets SEM meets multi-level SEM, because in a lot of cases you can do the same thing three different ways. But then sometimes one works better than the other. So I want you to have a menu of choices to pull from. What I call within person fluctuation models or the idea of the diaries and whatnot. This also gets thrown around with dynamic structural equation models, which is actually multi-level structural equation models where the term dynamic means that you're adding in autoregressive effects in most cases. It's a new marketing tool for the M plus people, that word. Uh, the same thing is true if we have clustered or nested observations. So if I have kids nested in classrooms, nested in schools, nested in districts, that kind of thing, these models work for them. The only catch is that that is actually way easier. Anybody have that kind of data, the clustered data in here? No, too bad, sorry. Because time is such a salient design feature that has to show up all throughout the model, and when you don't have that, it gets a lot more straightforward. Cross-classified models or cross-random effects models are also a subset of this. And I promised for all you IRT folks, theta is a random intercept. So the world of psychometrics to me is just another flavor of multi-level model because factor scores, theta, true score, our latent variables are random effects. So there are uh, synergies across the way that we can estimate them. People talk about them very differently with very different notation, but IRT in particular is a generalized mixed effects model because you're predicting a categorical outcome in most cases, whereas factor analysis would be a general version because you usually pretend the outcome is plausibly normal. So all of it's kind of the same is, is my, my point here. And I wished I had known that before. All right, how about we take a break uh, and maybe come back like 11.30? Does that work? So 18 minutes or so to do whatever we need to do? Cool. And I will hang out for a few minutes if anyone wants to chat. <laughs>